Hi guys, I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today. I had to have a meeting. We are going to move forward and learn about active transport though. These notes, or this PowerPoint actually, is going to be posted on Schoology for you. So, um, we have been learning about cellular transport, and remember that is the movement of substances into or out of a cell, and we talked about some various reasons why a cell might need to move things into or out of it. So, over the past couple of days, we've been talking about passive transport. Remember, passive transport is the movement of substances into or out of a cell that does not require energy. And we talked about contrast, the um, active transport requiring energy um, in order to move things in or out of the cell. So we're going to talk about why a cell would need to use energy and the different scenarios that would happen here. Um, now before we move forward with those scenarios, let's think about why use energy? If a cell can avoid using energy, why wouldn't it? Well, there are a couple scenarios, but let's first think about the conditions that needed to be true for passive transport to take place. In order for something to move passively, that's without energy, two conditions. First of all, the particle had to be small. Remember, the only things that could move directly through the phospholipid bilayer were oxygen, O2, carbon dioxide, CO2, and water, H2O. Remember, oxygen and CO2 move by diffusion, and, of course, a type of diffusion, osmosis, specific to water. The other thing that had to be true in order for something to move passively was that it was moving from a concentration where it was high to a lower concentration. So moving from high to low, that's with the concentration gradient, um, in order to establish equilibrium across that space. So, obviously, this might have you thinking, well, if we're going to have to use energy, probably one or more of these things is not true. Either it's not small or it's not moving with the gradient. So, active transport, just as a reminder here, it's movement across the cell membrane that does require energy. So, the first of those scenarios, the movement against the gradient, we're going to talk about that first. Sometimes a cell needs to import things like amino acids, sugars, and other substances from outside the cell, but the concentration outside the cell is already lower than inside the cell. So it's moving from an area of low to an area of high. So if you think about it, if it's going from low to high, it's going to become even lower on one side and even higher. So it's making that gradient even more extreme. This requires energy. Remember the usable form of energy by a cell is ATP or adenosine triphosphate. So this is movement against the gradient. So here's a depiction of active transport. So picture this shaded blue area as outside the cell and we'll picture this tan as inside the cell. So we have our cell membrane here, our phospholipid bilayer with our phosphate heads and two fatty acid tails. And embedded in this phospholipid bilayer is a protein. So here we have some little green squares. Let's just picture this as some substance. Here, the substance is in low concentration, and inside the cell, it's in high concentration. Now, if nature had its way, things would be moving from high to low out of the cell. But that's not what's happening here. We have this green substance being pushed into the cell, and it's coming through this protein that's embedded in that phospholipid bilayer. So it's moving from low to high against the gradient. Notice that this requires energy to move against the grain. So we have ATP coming in to aid this process. That particular protein that's embedded in the cell membrane is called a channel pump. Certain channel proteins in the cell membrane push molecules against their concentration gradient to maintain these unequal levels. This can work into or out of the cell, depending on what the substance is. Either way, a channel pump pushes something against the concentration gradient from low to high. That's one scenario where a cell would have to use active transport if you're moving from low to high against the gradient. Here's the other scenario where a cell would have to use energy. 
Cells need to use energy or active transport when substances are too large to fit through the cell membrane or even fit through those protein channels. In this case, a cell must use a sac called a vesicle. You guys learned about vesicles during your cell unit. A vesicle, again, is just a membrane-bound sac. It's a little packaging unit to carry something into or out of the cell that's too big to fit through the membrane. Vesicles can bring substances either in or out of the cell, and they're made up of a phospholipid bilayer, just like the cell membrane. This is important to note because of the fact that this later on is going to fuse with the cell membrane if the vesicle is moving out. And if the vesicle is moving in, this is actually formed from the cell membrane. So take a look at this picture of a vesicle here. You can see that each vesicle is made up of phosphate heads and fatty acid tails, just like our cell membrane. Vesicle movement into the cell, specifically, is called endocytosis. The prefix endo means into, and cyto means cell. There are two types of endocytosis, depending on what kind of substance the cell is bringing in. Pinocytosis is the movement of liquid into the cell by a vesicle. This is sort of like a cell drinking. In this case, tiny pockets from along the membrane fill with liquid and pinch off and travel into the cell. Alternatively, phagocytosis has to do with the cell eating. This is it taking in solids. So extensions of the cell membrane surround a particle and then package it in the vesicle and engulf it. Amoebas use this process. In fact, we have something called phagocytes in our body that literally travel around just taking in foreign substances and making sure they get broken up and dissolved and done away with. So, pinocytosis and phagocytosis are both types of endocytosis, which is vesicle movement in. Pino just has to do with liquid movement and phago with solid movement. Here's a depiction of pinocytosis. As you can see, this particular liquid, whatever it is, approaches the cell. The cell membrane surrounds this pocket of liquid. Okay, so you can see it's forming a vesicle around that pocket of liquid. Finally, it pinches off, forming the vesicle, which is now going to head somewhere in the cell, depending on what it is. Phagocytosis looks very similar. Here we have a solid object. Maybe it's food. The cell membrane surrounds that solid object, creates a vesicle. The cell membrane pinches off, and this vesicle goes wherever it needs to. If this is a, a piece of food, for example, that needs to be broken down, this might be headed towards the lysosome, which contains digestive enzymes, which might splice that food up a little more. Now, some of you guys might be looking at this diagram and thinking, well, if you're constantly pinching pieces off of the cell membrane, isn't the cell eventually going to get smaller? And the answer is no, because of the next type of vesicle movement. So, vesicle movement out of the cell. This is called exocytosis, the prefix exo meaning out of, and cyto, of course, meaning cell. In this case, the vesicles are not formed by the cell membrane, but formed by the Golgi bodies. An example of this is proteins. Proteins are just huge molecules. So the Golgi apparatus, or Golgi bodies, pu push this item into a little membrane-bound sac called a vesicle, and then it gets exported from the cell. So here's an example of exocytosis. So this vesicle, which was created by the Golgi bodies, containing some sort of large item, will go towards the cell membrane and eventually fuse with the cell membrane, therefore releasing this substance out into the space. So this is something that neurons use very often. So as you can see, this pho it's very important this is a phospholipid bilayer because it actually becomes part of the cell membrane. So this actually contributes to the size of the cell membrane, making the cell bigger. So as you can see, the exo and endocytosis sort of cancel each other out as far as cell membrane size. Okay, so that wraps up active transport. Remember, active transport is just the movement into or out of a cell that requires energy. And the two conditions 
that cause active transport instead of passive are that things are moving against the gradient from low to high or things are too large to be moving throughout the cell membrane, so they have to be packaged in a vesicle. Too big or against the gradient? Got to use energy or ATP.